Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 308 for Wednesday, June 16th, 2021. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Here, as usual, in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. Hey, man, how uh, how are things in California? What, a, what a, You had a, 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 like, yesterday, June 15th, was a, a day on the calendar for, for your state to, to open things up. Was it, a, was it a real day, or was it a more of a... a celebratorial day or something I would honorary say, day <laughs> i would say it was sort of a real day so okay for those who don't know our governor came out um about a month ago and said june 15th is a target date for california to get back to normal and that meant a whole bunch of different things he was a little vague about it at first and as as he as we got closer to june 15th he kind of refined the message and but actually about 10 days ago there was some messaging that he was not going to lift the California state of emergency, which mm. has a whole bunch of technical implications. But he's been on social media, you know, the last week, including quite a bit since yesterday, saying, if you're vaccinated, take your mask off. You can go do stuff, you know. Yeah. And the whole the whole no mask indoor thing is an honor system, which is confusing everybody. And I would say... And then remember, counties can go ahead and of course have their own level, but none, 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 none of the counties have done anything stricter than what the state advisors now. Sure. So everybody's supposedly on the same page. Every I went to the grocery store yesterday. I went to the hardware store. Masks were still required in those stores. I haven't been in a bar. Mm. Um, I'm playing one on Friday night, but um, I haven't been in a bar. Uh, I would just say there's a level, there's progress, there's general understanding that that it's less stringent than it was, but it's not like everybody threw their masks up into the air in all situations and are rolling along. So certain places are still fill, filling out. And along the lines, I wanted to share something. My bandmate, Simon Santiago, he's the other guitar player in the House Rockers, he just posted something really interesting. So Simon's solo acoustic career has really taken off. I mean, he right. Right. just kind of yeah. sees the bull by the horns and he's playing a lot of things, outdoor things. He um, is the father of a, I think a 10 year old. And um, he's a, he's a socially cons careful guy. No, I wouldn't say conservative. He's a socially careful guy. He actually posted, I know this is going to tick off some people, but here's my thing. If you're vaccinated, come to my shows, have fun, feel free to come up to me and request a song, you know, whatever you like. Thank you for getting vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, you please still come. But if you're going to come up to me or if you're going to ask somebody to dance, please wear a mask. Which I thought was a really interesting sure. thing, right? I mean, he got lots of kudos for saying it, which is what a lot of people are thinking. The responses had kind of a fairly representative sample of the confusion about why masks should still be a thing um, or distance if you are not vaccinated. If you're, you know, yeah. going to make that choice, you know, what does that mean? So he, you know, obviously, you know, if you're vaccinated, you can still get COVID. You just won't get as sick and you probably won't die, but you can get it and you can pass it on. And he, he doesn't want to be any part of that. So I, I, I feel the need to, to stop us here because the data isn't clear on that. Right. In fact, more and more the data is that the, the vaccines pretty much prevent you from getting COVID and therefore spreading it on. But we don't know. So like they're, they're, you're right. The, the fact that the two of us have different pieces of information, uh, the CDC has been pretty clear about it. Um, they're, you know, their their thing. They buried the lead, I think, in their communication when they said you can if you're vaccinated, you can take off your mask. What what was also in that report, but was not the headline of that report, was 
Yeah. And what we're finding is that like greater than 99% of the people that are vaccinated don't even get COVID, let alone mm. don't have symptoms. So, but again, like, like the fact that you and I are having this conversation, what, five weeks after the CDC's report shows that, you know, like nobody's certain about this and we won't be until it progresses forward. And Simon's thing makes perfect sense to me because we all have to make this decision for ourselves. Like we've been saying all along that this is going to be a rough entry, a rough landing for many of us. Um, our, our mutual friend, Naomi, I was having this conversation with her, Paul, she's someone from another world that we both live in. And, uh, and she said, yeah, I, I've equated it to a stone skipping across water. She's like, there's times when I'm comfortable, you know, doing whatever it is I'm, I wouldn't have done a year ago. And there's times when I'm not comfortable doing that. And, yeah. you know, those times are getting to be more frequent and, and closer to each other, but it's not a hundred percent of the time, just cause I was comfortable with something yesterday. doesn't mean I'm going to be comfortable with something similar tomorrow. You got to kind of feel it out. Right. And so Simon's thing made perfect sense to me. Um, and the confusion that, that you're talking about seeing in California, I feel like it seems like you're about four weeks behind us here in New Hampshire mm. um, in terms of, of, you know, the opening up and that initial week, two weeks of like, okay, how, wait, what, how are we, is it, should we, you know, like that, that was us four or five weeks ago. Um Got it. And, and so, and it makes sense, right? Like, this are you at the 70% um, vaccinated rate? Uh, New England in general is very high. I think there's only one state in New England that's actually at 70% vaccinated. Uh, but we're all, you know, well above 50, even well above 60, I think. So, right. and, and I was, again, you know, I hesitate to share this kind of stuff, but I, I will. Um, I was having a conversation with an epidemiologist that works for a very, very well-known pharmaceutical company. Um, and, and she said, we're already at, even when the CDC came out and said, you know, you can take off your mask. We were about a week behind, uh, you know, that was about a week before we had actually hit herd immunity. Like, wait, what mm -hmm. are you talking about? Yeah, right. <laughs> She's like, yeah, it, you know, when you combine the vaccinated people with all the people that had COVID and therefore also have, you know, effectively been naturally inoculated against this thing, we weren't quite at herd immunity when the CDC said that, but we are now. And and this is someone that has very young children and, you know, is comfortable doing all the things that that um that many people are doing and, and was not a year ago, you know, it was very, very mm -hmm. conservative uh, risk averse to it. I hate that the term conservative also brings political connotations. It's such, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. It's such an efficient term. And yet, and yet it's no longer an efficient term to say risk averse. So, um, so she, you know, she's very risk averse a year ago and now very comfortable with things. So I found that interesting again, take it as a data point and remember the plural of anecdote is not data. So, you know, do your own thing, make your own decisions, whatever you do that makes you feel safe is the right thing for you to do. Like, absolutely. We all need to do this. You know, it's, it, but in a, in a view from 10,000 feet, yeah. you know, it clearly, the ball is rolling forward. I mean, I'm yeah, seeing for sure. tours being booked. I'm seeing, you know, plans being made. So we are, and I only can see that picking up a lot of steam as people look to make, make up for lost time. So, yeah. so yes, we're in a little bit of a state that makes sense. We're about four weeks behind you. California is a big state with a lot of yeah. opinions and, it it's it, to close on this. It's been very interesting, the uh, proficiency of messaging. You know, I, I think back when we were going through the middle of it. You know, Cuomo was on TV every day. Newsom was on TV every day. Exactly where we were. Exactly what the hospitalization stuff was. And you know, trying to keep people informed. I think you know that those were good, admirable things. You think about the the pounding that Fauci gets now, you know, but that's science that, you know, stuff changes as they learn that's, stuff. That's the point and of were, science. That's how it that's works. Exactly. <laughs> it. And, you know, but there was, there is no uh, accommodation for understanding that. So I think it just says a lot more about how people hear what they want to hear and how people distrust what they want to distrust. Yeah. And, and it's hard for us to get to consensus as a society. 
Um, it's hard but, for us to get to, it's hard for me to get to consensus in my own head, <laughs> like for myself, like I can't even think about like my family and then society, like it's just difficult. And I mean, yeah, even over the last two weeks here, you know, the idea of, oh, well, you know, should we eat out in a restaurant today? And it's like, well, we did it yesterday. Okay. Yeah. But th today's a different day. Like, let's have the conversation. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'd rather not today. Okay. Like, you know, like it, it's fine. It, but it is that stone sort of skipping across the water. Yeah. No, no doubt. I, I have booked, I, oh, I, I saw a concert. I forgot to tell you. I went <laughs> and it, it was amazing. I, I don't know how I missed this. Um, it it was it was sort it was sort of amazing in a completely unnoteworthy way because like if I had gone to see this act any other time it would have been like oh what a throwaway um, it was a country guy named Jake Owen I think he was high uh, he he was confused <laughs> for the first I would say twenty to thirty minutes of the show and then things got a lot better uh, I, I believe it was the second night of the tour I think it was the first night in a relatively large place. This is a place near us, the bank of New Hampshire pavilion in Guilford for anybody that wants to look it up. Uh, this was a couple of weeks ago. It was a socially distanced show. It was built in COVID times and sold in COVID times. Uh, so it wasn't like a show from a year ago that had been postponed or anything. It was put together, I think in January, February, and they sold seats in pods and we had seats. It, it's a, it's one of these shed type places where there's a, a, it's outdoors, you know, essentially three, three non walls, uh, a pavilion with a lawn behind it. Uh, there's places like this all over the country. Uh, and, uh, and so we had a pod of four seats for the four of us in the family. The sound was great. His voice, he's a country guy. Uh, his, his voice, even when he was confused, was fantastic. I mean, he just has one of those like deep, rich country voices with a good range. And, uh, yeah. and it was great. He was confused. You know, like, there was one song that was one of his bigger hits, like one of the few songs I knew. And when they started the tune, the drummer was playing on timbales and it sounded something was wrong. And it's, it, I thought, Oh, it's just like the resonance of the timbale, the, the pitch of the timbale. It does not match the key that the song is in. Like, it sounded like something was out of tune. I'm like, must be the timbale or whatever. Halfway through the tune, I see the guy look down and realize he doesn't have his capo on his guitar. And then he he fixed that. He was playing an acoustic guitar. He had a band with oh him. My yeah, right. Like it was that kind of a thing that was happening. It happened several times, uh, especially during that first 30 minutes of the show. And then things settled in. So I don't know if it was nerves or weed or what, but, you know, he, <laughs> he figured it out. It was fine. And, you know, it's but that's it was sort of pleasant in the moment. Cause it's like, Oh, right. This is live music. Like stuff happens live. You deal with it live. You know, it's like, this is pretty good. And, um, you know, just being able to see a crowd of people, I, there's something I've always done at most shows I go to. And that's at one point or another during the night, I just turn around and look at the view, you know, behind me, I just take a slow spin is really all it is. And just enjoy the view. I don't take a picture of it. I just like, I do it for me. And I had not done that in a very long time. It had been, you know, almost 18 months since the mm. last time I did that. And it was, you know, it was kind of an emotional moment. Uh, I mean, it was an emotional moment when the house lights went down for the first time, you know, right. and, and certainly many emotional moments through the night. Um, on Sunday of this week, we're going to um, Saratoga Springs, New York, which is about four hours away. Trey Anastasio is doing three solo acoustic shows at, wow. at SPAC, uh, which is the Saratoga Performing Arts Center. Another one of these big sheds, that one's much bigger. It holds about 20,000 people. But this too was sold as a socially distanced show. So we have a pot of, I think, four tickets and three of us are going. We're trying to figure out if we can fit somebody else into our pod because we know how in demand these tickets are. But, um, but uh, you know, we bought tickets for one night. So we're going for Sunday and uh, and looking forward to that too. But we do have some tickets for some general admission, not distanced concerts this summer. And um, I, I feel like I'm going to be okay with that, but I'll let you know on the day of if I actually yeah. am. I, you know, it's like it, I think by then I, I will be, I think even now I might be, but I haven't had to make that decision yet. So um one it's day at weird. a time. It's one day at a time. That's exactly it. Yeah. 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 So. Hey, I want to share with you. Um, I haven't, I don't, 
know if I've ever mentioned to you that I'm a big Bruce Springsteen fan. Have I ever brought that up on the show? Now, who is this Bruce Springsteen guy? What's it's, his? It's been a long time since I've had the opportunity to kind of to to yeah. float float about this. So uh, today, um, the Killers, great one of them. I would say one of the most influential bands of the 21st century, right? Yeah, so, great you know, band. So, so they yeah. they reissued one of their songs. Uh, in a video format with, with uh, Springsteen Planner. And I was just thinking to myself, I get that a lot of people j- don't get Bruce or dislike Bruce. I get it. You sure. know, I, well, actually, I don't get it, but I, at an intellectual level, I, I accept You accept it. that that can be a thing. Sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I was thinking about the cool thing for me about Bruce. I mean, I love the music. I love the songs and I love the storytelling and I love the experience of the performances. But... In choosing our rock idols, our rock stars, you know, I could never be Jimmy Page. I don't have that much stuff. I don't have, you know, like, like there, you can aspire to different things. I was reflecting that one of the great connecting points about Bruce, this is, this is an iconic rock star who still does surprise appearances at the local bars, you know, sure. fairly often, sure. who, you know, has an interest in connecting with the next generation or you know, maybe two generations below of, of, uh, of musicians that are doing things to, you know, he, he's just, he's just like, he's like Dave Grohl, you know, I, I mean, I would say Dave Grohl would be the next generation. And then, yeah. you know, I would say the, the killers and, and, you know, other bands that kind of came about in the two thousands would be, would be another generation removed. But I just, I just continue to be in awe of how to model an artistic life. Mm. He's still, to me, I mean, I know he's a gazillionaire, but to me, there's so much uh, everydayism in him, you know, like yeah. he does stuff that I can identify with on a fairly often basis that has kept me a fan for 50 years, you know, like a fanatic for 50 years, but it's just, there's this connection that I can do. I love Zeppelin. I love the who, but you know, that era of, you know, British rock royalty, the, that, those were lifestyles and people, you know, I, we, I think we did a show once where we talked about cover bands and that, you know, if you're in your fifties and you're not in great shape and you're, um, you know, you're putting on overly tight leather pants to go out and kind of posture on stage and it's not ironic, it's a tough sell, <laughs> right? It's, sure, it's, sure, <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. you know. Anyway, so I was just thinking, you know, about Bruce and then I was thinking about Grohl and, you know, about how we pick our rock stars and what are the things that resonate with them. I mean, Grohl is the mayor of rock and roll now. I mean, you know, that's Bruce what I keep is saying. probably yeah. senior statesman, you know, I would say Bruce and, you know, and Mick and, oh, you know, the, I, it, those I that mean, are left. I, I am someone for whom Bruce Springsteen has, certainly has never resonated at the same level that it has with you. I, I appreciate some of his songs. Uh, if, uh, obviously, he... He deserves all the success that he has, in my opinion. You, you know, I have no issue with where he is. And I I totally agree with you that he is a, you know, accurately referred to as a senior statesman of rock and roll. Like, like that is supported 100%. Um, but but I, I just never have gotten Bruce. But he yeah. absolutely is that senior statement and I and statesman. And I like he earned that he he created that for himself. Is maybe but a better way, way of saying earned it. Yeah. Yes. He created that. He worked it. He worked um, it. Yeah. Yeah. And and Grohl is that guy now. He's the voice of, you know. <laughs> he is. <laughs> you you gave me a perfect segue, which I don't know if you wanted to, but um, it, I watched a Dave Grohl movie last night. I watched that What Drives Us, the, the new movie. I and, don't know about it. Yeah. So Dave, I, I, I'm assuming, this is me projecting, but I, you know, I think I'm right about this. Uh Dave had the opportunity and did uh, to buy his, the van that they first used when they were touring as the Foo Fighters. Uh, mm. It was this red van. And so he bought it. And I think that inspired him to go and think about like van touring life and go talk to lots of different musicians about their experiences in van touring life. And so like there are people, and so it's a documentary, it's Dave basically just interviewing these people or letting these people talk most of the time. Uh, You you know, the edge is in there, fleas in there, Tony Canal from no doubt, Dave Lombardo, uh, St. Vincent's in there. Uh, you know, drummer from the dead Kennedys, whose name currently escapes me is in there. Uh, Ringo's in there and they all are telling their, uh, their van tour stories. And every one of them has a unique experience 
that is exactly the same as everybody else's, right? Like, you know, individually very unique. I hate saying very unique. I hate that I said very unique. Unique is a binary <laughs> thing. It's either it's either unique or it's not. There's no there's no degrees of this. Uh, anyway, they all have their unique stories, but zoomed out a little bit, they're all the same. It's we left our lives or what could have been our lives behind. We got in the van. We drove. We drove. We drove. We drove. We drove. We played gigs every now and then. We drove. We drove. We drove. We had all these weird experiences in the van. We played gigs. Like that's what this was about. But. Jumping around a little bit and addressing one of the points that you're sort of talking about here, it, it was this movie is interesting because it's I feel like it's going to be out of reach for most people to 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 have any resonance with it. Right. I mean, it's Dave Grohl talking to his uber successful rock star friends about the times, the days when they weren't uber successful and how they all did the, the same thing and, and made it to this uber successful point. Right. And, and not one of them says it was easy. Like they all, you know, it, it fully agree that it was hard work. Uh, obviously there's more to it than just hard work. Cause there's a million stories of bands that, you know, went on the road and never achieved this level of fame. So, and, and, and there's a lot of bands that never went on the road, even as someone that spent a very, very small amount of time on the road at a very, very low level, you know, there was a lot of this movie that was just like, not, I couldn't relate to it because I'm not those people, but it was interesting mm -hmm. hearing most of their stories and it, you know, for the most part, but there was one moment very much in this vein of, you know, rock star buddies talking to each other where flea was saying, he's like, Oh yeah, I was talking to Tom York about this. He said, I feel like it was Tom York's idea. And, and he says, I feel like there was a moment in the mid nineties where somebody drew a line in the sand and said, okay, every band that uh, is on this side of the line, that's already able to like tour the world and sell out arenas. You all get to continue doing that for as long as you want. And everybody else, nobody else is allowed in this club. And that's it. And, you know, when he said this to Dave, Dave was like, huh. You know, and there was just this moment where I was going, huh. I don't know that Tom York has been proven wrong yet. I hope mm -hmm. that he will be. But like, I couldn't think of any bands that came out in the 2000s that can go and sell out arenas. I hope, I hope I'm missing something. And you'll tell us feedback at giggabpodcast.com. But um, uh, I don't know. Like, can you think of something? I can. I, like, it, do do Mumford and Sons or the Avett Brothers? Like, I don't think those bands check that box. Yeah. Right. I have, to, I have to give some thought because same. Yeah. You know, it seems like the manufactured acts. You know, the 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 American Idol. Yeah. Singer performers are the big ones. But they're I'm fleeting. To think about any bands. They, well, and Taylor Swift isn't isn't fleeting, right? Okay, so fair, right? You've got a Taylor Swift, you've got a Justin Timberlake who can probably go and and fill up, uh, you know, a um. A, a, but arena, arena, I guess, what we would call arena rock, yeah, is a is a point in the sand. I don't, I'd have to think about that. I know. I mean, what what about like Lincoln Park and those types of bands? Can they go fill arenas today? Like they you they could. There's bands that have gotten to the point where they can fill arenas. I think so. But do they hold that point? Like that's the you can make the reservation. Can you hold the reservation? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think they probably are. I think, you know, if I, hope are listening, I hope I'm just missing something. Yeah. Yeah. I think they probably are. But you know, the era of arena rock is not as as fruitful as yeah. it once upon a time was. I agree with that. It was and 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 so that was one of the things that that came out of this Tony canal had a couple of um, had a couple of really sort of poignant things to say, you know, that, that sort of resonated with everybody else or were, were representative of what everybody else was saying. It's like, you know, when we were in the van, it was us against the world. And he's like, that informed me in the rest of my life. He says, now life for me is just waiting for those moments to get back on stage, which I thought was yeah. something kind of resonated with us all. Ringo tells a story about how he's like, we never, it's just so weird to think about the Beatles being a, a van band, like, <laughs> right. right. But, but they weren't been for very long though. Right. Eh, right. Not for very long, but they were, you know, they, they certainly paid their dues. He's like, we were never smart enough to like get a hotel room where the gig was, or even pitch a tent. He's like, we always drove home after the gigs. He says there was one mm. night driving back from a gig in London. He said it was like the coldest night ever in the, you know, in England. And, uh, he said it was you know, snowing 
and the windshield popped out like it cracked. Oh, and, yeah. And he said they had a bench across the front of the van. And he said, so <laughs> the way they drove and I'm not, he, the way he tells the story, there, there's like, there's the missing element of who, but who was driving. Um, but he said what they did, it reminded me of what penguins do when it's cold. He said, you know, we all sort of laid on top of each other on the bench seat and the person who uh, was at the top took a shot of whiskey to, to like numb wow. the cold. And then that person got to go down to the bottom and the next person went up to the top and took a shot of whiskey and they, they just rotated until they made it back. But like, these are the stories. Um, so do you remember we had Robert Berry on the show? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So Robert is a local Bay area guy who um, has had some levels of, of success mm. in the prog rock world. Right. Anyway, you know, and he's still at it. And uh, he, I think it was two years ago, maybe three years ago, um, had a new album and he did a tour of the Northeast, uh, Canada down to, I think, North Carolina, right? Mm. 30 days. And one of the people in his band is a, a lifelong friend of his, who's also a friend of mine, who went on this tour. And it was so fascinating to hear my friend Paul Keller's, um, uh, you know, how he had to kind of go through the decision matrix to do this. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, the stories of, you know, 50 plus year old guys, you know, doing a van tour for 30 days. Would you do it for 30 days right here and right now? If, if you had a, if you had a band that you'd like to do, would you do 30 days knowing that you were going to kind of like long drives, probably have a couple of nights, not enough sleep. I mean, would you do it for the excitement knowing it would come to an end in 30 days or would you never do it again? You know, I, I definitely do it for 30 days. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But you, you know gotta understand, like days. I got a little bit of money in the bank, you know, if worse comes to worse and I need to like spend yeah. outside the budget for a hotel room, even for the whole band, like that's not out of the question, right. Of, of possibilities. So I different def- when you have no money and yeah. your survival like, is moment to moment. You don't know if you're going to get a meal that day. And- if I had to do it the way that I did it in my twenties, like with the clam bake, I mean, I probably still would to be perfectly honest, but only because I've done it and I know what it, I know what it's like when, when I was on the road, you know, it like, it gets so, it's so boring. It, it's, <laughs> and you're living with these people and like they simultaneously are your entire support structure and also the people responsible for you needing a support structure, right? Like at often at exactly the same time, like you, yeah. they, it's maddening the whole thing. But you know, those 23 hours a day of dealing with all that crap, the, the people, the driving, the, you know, the, the logistics, the load in the load out, for the one hour a day or the two hours a day that you get to be on stage, it's totally worth it because, and this movie last night reminded me of this. So if you had asked me this question last week, I'm not sure I would have answered the same way, but you know, flea and and Mike Watt both said this in different ways. They're like, you know, you're in this pressure cooker in the van and just dealing with all the crap that you have to deal with. And it get you get to let it out on stage and it really becomes even more cathartic, way more cathartic than most gigs that you do when you go to sleep home at, at you know, at night or whatever. And you're just like separating from your life for a little bit to go do a gig and then come back when the gig is your life. When, when that's the focus, it really becomes this important thing. And it's about the connection with the people. It's about the connection with your bandmates. It's about the connection with the music, so uh, yeah, I, I would. In fact, I I had a moment last night. I was I started taking notes at, as I was watching this movie because it was like, oh, there's things I want to remember and talk about on the show. Like this is important. And then I and then I had my own thought, and I wrote this down too, because I was reminded not of the clam bake, although this would certainly apply to them. But but my memory wound up going even further back to the bands I played with, like in high school and in college. And it was like, you know, my, my, my initial thought that I wrote down was savor each moment because it's too easy to take this weekend's gig for granted. And, and, and so I share this with you, but I, it, this really was something I, I wrote to myself, you know, before Mm. you go on stage, think about what you wouldn't give to go back to your high school band or college band and play those songs one more time with those people in that environment you know, I, and I had some really magical moments with those people, just like I do with the people that I play with today. Right. But you, it's too easy to take it for granted 
what you're doing in the moment because there's all the crap that goes around it. And it's, you know, the, the, as often is the case, the memories uh, sort of allow the, the, the negative stuff to fade away. And then all you're left with is the great moments, usually not always, but usually that's how memory works. And so, you know, my advice to myself that I share with all of you is, you know, think about what you wouldn't give to, to be able to go and play with one of your old bandmates again, wh whoever that person or those people are, and then yeah. take that on stage with you the next time you go on stage and every time you go on stage, because th that will be true in the future. So, well, I mean, as if what we all almost had taken away with us yeah. through COVID right. not, you know, <laughs> yes. going to be fresh in our minds for at least the next 12 months. But I, I think that's a really interesting thing. When you, when you think about musicians preparing for gigs, you know, we talk about people who we always say, always be performing, right? Like, yeah, like well, yeah, this is you, a part of that. That's right. Yeah. This is a part of it. And if you need the mo this is the motivation to always be performing. That's like, it. Right. You are doing something that is going to mean quite a bit. You know, there's someone in the back of the room who's having a crappy day or a crappy week or a crappy life. And or there's someone on stage who's having a crappy day and it might be you, right? <laughs> like uh, <laughs> any of those things could be true, but you get yeah. to, you get to redefine that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, like the, the other interesting thing that I learned from this that I had no idea was they started talking about, you know, obviously talking about van touring and they started talking about the beginning of van touring and really where it began was the college touring circuit, if you will. And, universally anybody that had looked at or simply knew the history of this all agreed that it was the same thing. And it started with a band called DOA Canadian band that wanted to tour the United States. And so they, they just made it happen. They, they figured out what clubs existed in a few cities. They toured from Canada down to LA. And when they got to LA, they played a gig or met with the band black flag, told them what they were doing. That gave Black Flag an idea and Black Flag sort of did the reverse, went up the coast and into Canada. And when they got to Canada, I can't remember who's I'll use the term manager, although they probably didn't use it at the time. But whose manager, whether, whether it was DOAs or Black Flags, decided, wait a minute, we're building a network here. And so, you know, they talked about and I definitely had this. We had it in a clam bake for sure, but I even had it with Go Figure where there was they, they said there was the, the handwritten list of clubs that you knew of and which city they were in and the name and phone number of the booking agent. And then in their list, which the clam bake also had, we didn't have this in go figure cause we weren't really touring uh, was a list of for them, the punk friendly houses that yeah. you could stay at after you played the gig in the various cities to, you know, help keep your costs down, obviously no hotels. And that was the beginning of the college touring circuit and the van touring circuit. And then Th those lists just got shared and, and, you know, if it, if the internet had existed, well, it, it, like all of this would be different anyway, but it, you know, the list would have obviously been turned into a wiki and like people would have edited it and probably people would have been, <laughs> probably people would have been like holding things back out of it because that's how we are these days. But back then it was just like, we're all in this together. We're all trying to do the same thing. Let's just share what we can. Who do you know? Somebody at this club. I know somebody at that club. And it was just a very, you know, collaborative thing. Um, and, uh, and it was just fascinating. I had no idea. It makes sense that it had to start with one band because, yeah. you know, like that's how these things happen. There's just not a magic list that exists, you know, but um, yeah, it's just, it, it reminded me when I was, when I auditioned with Hypnotic Clambake, I was living in Austin. They were touring through Austin on the tour prior to the one that I wound up joining them on. I was brought out, I might've told this story on the show before, but I'll make it quick. I was brought, they, they were staying at one of these places. It was this farmhouse just outside of Austin. And so I went to pick up Maury, the leader of the band. We actually went back to my house where we did my audition because I had drums there. Um, but I got to the house and I went in and it was this little farmhouse and I was in the kitchen and Maury was there and the woman who, you know, was one of the owners of the farm was there. And then this guy came in the room and he the way she treated him, he was this, you know, 40 plus year old guy, the grown man. Um, the way she treated him was almost like he was autistic or something. I mean, it was never explained to me why she treated him this way, but it was like, 
okay. You know, he was like, I think I'm going to go out for a run. And she's like, okay, Jonathan, do you <laughs> know where you're going? You know, do you make sure we, we talked about this yesterday, make sure when you get to the, whatever, you know, landmark, you've got to take a right there, Jonathan. You're, yes, I remember. Okay. Yes. I take a right at the landmark. You know, it was very kind conversation, but it was just a little bit more, you know, parent child than, than you would expect for people of those ages, which is why I, I sort of interpreted maybe he's, you know, high functioning autism or something. I don't know, you know, and so off he went. And then Maury and I got in the car to drive back to my place. And as we were driving out of the farm, he's like, hey, do you know who that was? And I'm like, no. And he's like, that's Jonathan Richmond. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, okay. He's like, yeah, these people are just on that list. Like they're known as a, a, a friendly place, safe place for, you know, touring musicians to stay. Yeah. I was That's like, wow, so it's fascinating to me. And then, of course, when we were on the road with the clan bike, we stayed at, at a variety of those, um, you know, because that's what you do. But I just thought it was interesting that it started with, you know, everybody agreed. They're like, oh, yeah, it was DOA. Like, what? Oh, OK. <laughs> like, nobody had to oh, think. Weird. They either knew the answer or they didn't, you know, but it, there was no there was no argument about, well, technically, you know, so. I just thought you know, it was I, I'm hearing you say this and I'm thinking about. um Cover band scenes. So Russ and my band, the drummer in my band, who you know, yeah, he um, he and his brother started a cover band in 1969 or 1970, and through the 70s, you know, they were good. There was a circuit in the western part of the United States that cover bands could do. You know, there, there were holiday inns, and there were you know, and you know, there was a you know, it wasn't van touring because it wasn't you know there was money they were getting paid sure. by these bars because they were filling them with with people drinking and you know socializing so there was there was that now think about this for a second most cover band circuits now are a fairly local thing right draw, draw the circle however you want 50 sure. miles 100 miles whatever sure, it may yeah, be yeah. but but most cover bands are you know are operating within a fairly and you know this is somehow dot, dot, dot connected to the fact that there's a lot of part-timers in it, you know, a lot of weekend yeah. warriors, a lot a lot of guys with day jobs uh, and families. But imagine if it wasn't. Imagine if the cover band scene, the music scene was like it was in the 70s. And remember, you know, I told you about my buddy um, um, Steve, um, <laughs> my good buddy who I can't remember. His yeah, name. yeah. 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 Went to different schools together even. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you know, he, he was playing six nights a week in the seventies in the Bay area and could buy a house. Right. And so, you know, this is how far we've gotten. We've had discussions about how the pays pay is the same as it was 50 years ago. Sure. And, you know, how crazy it is. But think about that. If there, if, if whatever things had happened, drunk driving laws, smoking laws, you know, whatever are the things that, that change the models of, of, uh, of bar bands, uh, hadn't done that. And there were still these types of things where, where you had to be a good musician to be a cover band musician, you know, to, you know, the gigs were hard to get. It was competitive. They were professional musicians and they, you know, there were people coming through, there were different faces all the time. It's so different than now where a guy who has a good network of friends and can fill a bar, you know, once or twice a month, you know, the musicianship is somewhat secondary you know it's, right it's, right i right? you know it, it was back when clubs had their own crowds and you could tour to to play in front of those crowds it's not all that different from the original circuit right like i mean when when certainly when i was doing it with the clam bake and i i think it's this way now there are clubs that are known for bringing in those touring acts and you know the, the b level c level d level touring acts you know whatever you want to call it uh that are, you know, original clubs and, and you would play those and, and, you, and they would draw because the, you knew, oh, okay, this club cultivates like this type of music or, or the, the types of, they have a good vibe there. So I'm going to go there and see mm -hmm. this band and I know it's going to be fun. Colleges were, were the, were in probably still are the best, uh, I would think, because you have a built in crowd of people that doesn't really venture outside of walking distance. Right. So it, um, it certainly back then that was the key, right? You go yep. play college towns because you've got the built in crowd and it's great. So, but the, all these things paid back in the day, right? Like mm -hmm. you do a frat party, it paid, you know, Oh yeah. We'd made a lot of good money money. frat parties. Yeah. 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 No, with, with go just, figure. And this is back in the early nineties, a frat party was a minimum two grand. Payday. Yeah. yeah, it was good. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was good. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but so were like well, bar gigs also paid us. Like by that point, we were you know we could fill a bar. Um, so we were making a thousand bucks for a bar gig. You know, not un- in the nineties, not uncommon. Yeah, that band yeah. did pretty well. I mean, that was the thing. You know, I I now, I mean, I I still think that it was it was the. Uh, you know, we had good songs. We were good with a crowd. We engaged people. We were great with our offstage engagement, the mailing list, the merchandise that, you know, like we you did all, together. We had our act together. And all of that is responsible for retaining the crowd in terms of attracting the crowd. History and being able to look back with, you know, 2020 vision, <laughs> I, I have to think 2020 hindsight. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we wound up being invited to play these things called, um, that were called gathering of the vibes. They were these private parties where people ate mushrooms. And I really think, you know, we started playing those and then suddenly like our popularity and they were all on, not on campus at, at the university of Connecticut, but you know, houses around campus, they were certainly targeted at, you know, all the students that were there in the middle of nowhere and in, in upstate Connecticut, you know, around, uh, around UConn. And I, I think those parties were responsible for people, you know, people would come, they'd have mushrooms. They'd, they'd see the band play. They'd say, Oh my God, an amazing time. Like that band's great. Like, well, yes, we are great. However, you, are you were also on mushrooms. Like you, I, your, your perception of your enjoyment of that event may have been impacted by something in addition to the band. And, uh, and that's when we went from playing for, you know, 50 people to 500 or a thousand people, uh, pretty quickly. But again, we were one of the few bands on campus that had our act together. Like there, there were a lot of factors, but I, I, I think we have to credit that as being at least one of them. So. But that's okay. So, you know, look, it worked out for the Grateful Dead. I mean, they were they were okay. Owsley's traveling LSD sales force long before they were a touring band. Like, <laughs> like that was why they became a touring band. They were they were funded by Owsley. It's it's fine. And it was as I was telling somebody the story about like the beginnings of the Grateful Dead that I was like, oh, wait a minute, go figure might have benefited in a similar way. Okay, that's, funny. that's fine. Oh well, it's all good. But yeah, yeah, it's um, it's interesting, you know. So. Hey, I have one more thing to share with you today. So Go. I wanted to give you a, a little bit of a report of the secret show we're doing on Friday night. So Ooh. I think I, you know, we, I've teased it here a couple times, but uh, the band got together and we rehearsed three days in May. We had two more scheduled in June and we wanted one of those to be a tech rehearsal, like give our sound guy a chance to set up our whole system and go through the whole thing and have us kind of go through a show. So we had one more rehearsal to go through a few more songs, but then the last one was going to be a full run through of our whole show. And the opportunity came up for us to do it uh, in this kind of industrial um craft brewery you know it's sure and so we're like well that's cool you know yeah we why don't we make this interesting right is everybody we, the first couple of rehearsals went so well and clearly the guys recalled the tunes or did the wood shedding that i felt like the last one could be open and so but we it's not a huge place and there's not great parking so i didn't want to like hey gig because we it would probably be a bad experience for the brewery you know it was yeah, nice enough to ha- yeah. have us there so we decided to kind of be a little stealthy about it and and do a surprise show. And so I posted a bunch of clues that had the who, what, when, and where uh, of the show uh, on Facebook. And I did it on the House Rockers Facebook page. And I wasn't, you know, thinking that this would go viral. People would have fun with it, all this type of stuff. And the pickup wasn't significant enough, right? So I started adding my page, my personal page to it and got a little bit more and, you know, then the guys got involved. But the reflection of, again, Facebook is not your friend. Your, you know, your fans are not yours. They're Facebook's fans, right? Absolutely. Unless you want to, unless you want to pay for the access to them. What As, I, and I, that's I, especially true of, of pages versus your personal feed, right? Like your friends will have a greater, much greater chance of seeing things on your personal feed than they will on any page or page, you know, personal, even a personal page that you manage or whatever. Right. Like that. Yeah. You got to pay money to, to get exposure with to anything you post there, especially things like events 
and other stuff that Facebook knows, you know, <laughs> they, yeah. they figured it out. Yeah. Yeah. So the last part of this was I, I did a private event from my personal page and invited the people I knew and, you know, said, here are the clues, but if you have a hard time with them, ask me and I'll give you, you know, more clues. And, and so just kind of played it a little bit and it'll be good. It'll be the That's great. exact number of people that we wanted to have there. But the reflection was a good to do something that just keeps your scene interesting, you know, just keeps yeah. it fun, vibrant, alive. Right. And especially as we're getting back into things good for our our band's brand, you know, that we do interesting things. We're, there's no charge for this, right? Right. So, you know, when the, when the situation is right, we, you know, we may do something cool and just well, have and some I like fun. And I like created a little mystique. Like, I, if, if all the bands that I like have their own way of doing that same kind of thing. Not, maybe not all the bands, but a lot of the bands that I like, you know, they have their own vibe their own lore sure their their own way of thinking about the band that that their fans might do and this has nothing to do with or it certainly can be and should be at least separate from the stage and that it's happening when you're not on stage it can it can be involved when you're on the stage too but but just that whole you know i want to learn more what where's the mystery here what 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 in what is this about what do you mean yeah. by that like those kinds of things the inside jokes that you let your fans in on you know piecemeal that that what a it's such a it's such a powerful thing that i think you're really smart to to start doing some things like that. Well, I appreciate that. And there are some bands that just like nobody in the band thinks that way, but they get booked all the time. I mean, they you yeah, know, yeah. have a shrewd connection. They do this. Everything. But for me, it was it, the whole reason to get back into music and to, you know, was to build something that meant something to people. Yeah. And I think the guys in my band, I've chosen them and they've chosen me because they have a similar perspective of things. And it's clearly it's lasted a number of years. It's to what you're saying about creating mystique. Um, it's not elitist though. Like no, I'll no, give you no. an example. No, it's, Simon, in, it's inclusive, not exclusive. It is inclusive. It's, right. But, but you have to put in a little bit of work to be included, but that's, that's the only thing is, you know, like I want to, I want to engage a little bit and now you're in the yeah. club. That's it. it that's all it takes. Club. That's it. That's right. And clubs are incredibly powerful things. I mean, that, yeah. that's when fan bases multiply. Simon, uh, you know, he's just so good a bandmate in so many ways. So right now he's probably doing 20 to 30 acoustic solo dates and they're not actually solo dates. He's actually done something really smart and he has two or three bass players, two or three drummers. Yeah. And then his brother, you know, plays guitar and he creates little mini shows and, and he's been going, but his, um, part of his persona is that he's the guitar player in the house rockers as well. You know, that that's, that's part of who he is. And you have a chance to see a guy who's in the house rockers doing a solo gig. And that's a very unique thing. If you manip, if you cultivate it, so it's not an elitist thing, like I'm in this band, but it's more like, Hey, yes, we're a hardworking band. And when I'm not in that hardworking band, I'm out here being a hardworking guy, you know, doing my solo gigs. Right. And that uh, is it, very complimentary in, in how, what he does in the house rockers and what he does as a solo thing. It was kind of what I was doing when I was doing so many solo gigs up there as well is like, you know, we are working musicians who are out there and it's all connected for me. When I do the solo stuff, it's because I want to play a little bit quieter music because sure. when I'm with the 10 guys, it's, you know, over the top stuff. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's all good, but, but um, yeah, the, the, the big lesson, the reason I brought, bring this all up is a reminder uh, Facebook is not your friend. Even if you pay the money, Facebook is not your friend. No, I mean, no, you know, you're, you're just, you could actually take an ad and not be guaranteed that all the people who are fans of your page are not going to see a freaking ad that you, 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 oh, you that's right. Harness the, right? It's, it's, it's a transactional it's relationship ridiculous. at best. Well, or it is a transactional relationship, whether it's a mutually beneficial one or not depends on many factors, some of which are out of your control. Yeah. Yeah. The best thing that can happen is that you create something and I don't even know what happens. If you, if you create something where all your fans start sharing stuff, does Facebook throttle it down and say, we're going to cut the shit off until somebody pays something or, <laughs> or, you know, or, or is, is true virality possible? I mean, we have a couple of events we've created where, you know, five, 600 people have, have said going or interested and I don't know where they all came from. You know, no, that, I, I think happen. you're, I think, well, you're, you're hitting on something that we've been experimenting with too. Here at Backbeat Media uh, earlier this year, we 
added a new position. We have uh, Sadie Sear on board doing uh, promotion for some of our shows. Eventually it'll, it'll expand to most of our shows, but you know, we're experimenting with a few figuring out the ways to do it. And we found that, you know, certainly this is no great surprise. The most powerful thing is when someone else shares your stuff. Um, and so we've really been targeting like instead there's two schools of thought, right? One is, don't target your most diehard fans. Go find other people who will become your diehard fans, right? And try and reach them directly. And certainly we're doing some of that. And, you know, you got to speak to people in the language of where they are as opposed to where you want them to be and bring them in. And like we're learning and and actually having a little bit of success, success with that. But one thing that, that we are experimenting with alongside that is exactly what you're saying, targeting our most fervent fans and asking them take this please and share it with other people. Uh, and, and that has been working pretty well. I mean, we only, we've only really started that in the last couple of weeks, so we don't have a ton of data on it, but there there's power in that because, mm -hmm. because to your point, like that, even, even just that third party validation of something is huge like word of mouth, if you will. And we're just trying to seed word of mouth a little bit and it seems to be working. So, um, so I will say that to you, dear listener, please take this episode and share it with one of your friends. <laughs> um, that, that is the way to help expand the gig gab family is, is exactly that. Um, so we would, we would love it if you did that. I found something, Paul, uh, in, I, you know, I'm always, well, we love gear, right? Um, uh, I found a thing called the catapult from radial engineering on the surface. It looks like a little sub snake. It's got four XLR ins, four XLR outs and two ethernet connectors. And what it is, is it is exactly that it's a little snake, but instead of connecting over a big, you know, braided set of, of XLR cables or their contents, it connects over, uh, you know, cat five, which is, you know, eight twisted pairs or four twisted pairs, sorry, uh, typical ethernet cable. And it makes it way easier to have a little sub snake somewhere and you can do any, well, not any length you want, but it way easier to be more flexible with this thing. The only issue I'm, and I haven't tested it yet, but, uh, my only issue is that it it's expensive. It's 140 bucks. And you need two of them because you need one on either end for it right. to actually work. Um, but it is, they're all pass through. So, you know, you, you can sort of use this in a variety of different ways, but, um, but I thought it was an interesting either end or powered or not powered. It is not powered. It's passive. That's the, that's sort of the, the, the magical part of this is it really is just sending the signal over the ethernet cable. It's not, there's no, there's no power. There's no hum. So they say, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's just one of those interesting things. I haven't tested it yet. So, uh, if you do and you let us know, we'll let other people know, but eventually I'll get one in or two, I guess I'll have to spend the 280 bucks and yeah. test them out. But it's just like an interesting thing. I would love, you know, like what I did here in the studio where I've got, um, I'm, I'm doing 24 digital channels and, but they're, they're three eight by eight units essentially, uh, mm -hmm. connected via light pipe, right? Connected via fiber uh, cable. So it's really nice to be able to say, oh, I just run, well, I run four fiber cables so that I have out the outputs and the inputs to both of them. But it's way better than running 16 or 32 XLRs, right? So it, it you know, <laughs> makes, makes a lot of sense to sort of pull this stuff together. And this, this fits into that mindset. Yeah. And we use Cat5 um, between our stage box and our mixer with the, um, you know, we have the, the Midas, uh, M32, but the same works with the Behringer X32 in the wedding band in, in uptown. And it works great. Cause you know, all you need is a XLR cable run to the stage. That's, that's it. There's, you know, you don't need to run a huge snake anymore or anything like that. So wow. uh, not XLR, sorry, uh, uh, an ethernet cable run between yeah. them and, and that's all it is. So um, and it like the theater, they run, they have one ethernet cable. Actually, they've got a couple of them run in the walls. So wherever the stage box needs to be, as long as it's in one of the predetermined locations, it's like, yep, there's the ethernet cable, plug it in, done, good to go. And like those need to be powered. The stage boxes do this, this thing does not, which, yeah. So 
anyway, I share because it's fun. It's gear. Good stuff. That's yeah. all I got, man. You got anything else? No, we went all over the place today. We did. Yeah, this was a good one. Thanks for uh, thanks for letting us ramble, folks. We love it. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We would love to hear from you. Thanks, Dave. I, yeah, thank you, Paul, man. This is uh, this has been good. I, I like this one. I like this one. Yeah. I love that movie, What Drives Us. Go check it out. I'll put, a, I'll put a link to it so you can go see the trailer and then go, go watch it. What's that thing that hey, uh, we say? That thing, yeah. I you know what I say. What do you say? Always be performing. Always. Always.